It is a classic landscape, a landscape that is actually being shaped by humans. And although we may get very excited by the archaeological remains in it, we should really think of the whole New Forest as a basically an archaeological feature, a heritage feature. Everywhere you look in there, you can see signs of how that, that um, <coughs> landscape has developed over time, how people have actually formed uh, what we see now. And you know, although we see it as a, um, as a traditional landscape, a lot of people, particularly, uh, we call them outsiders, but uh, you know, people come to these areas and kind of see that as a, a wilderness, a, a kind of a beautiful, potentially natural landscape, but we know very much this is not the case. Um, and the, uh, you know, it is a way of, it's really important that we actually educate people on the ecological evolution of the new forest to understand the unique way that it's actually come to where it is nowadays. Um, and you know, a lot of people will kind of tell you a lot about uh, how the landscape has changed in, in the more recent periods, uh, particularly looking at um, the unique range of charters and laws that basically came in and the way the enclosures came about and all of these kind of tussles between locals and governments and all these sorts of things that have happened. Um, but we can certainly see, you know, we can go back quite a way thanks to the, the rich documentary and cartographic records to actually look at how this landscape has changed physically, to look at changes in the woodlands, whether broadleaf or um, uh, conifer plantations or peatlands, grasslands, mire systems and all those sorts of things to actually uncover, certainly over the last few hundred years, how it's changed. Um, but we, sometimes we want to actually go a lot deeper than that into the past. What can we, how can we actually remote sent right back into some of these prehistoric periods and find things out about it? And the way we can do that, and we're very fortunate in the new forest, is that we have some beautiful archives, and some basic locations where we can go, we can get material that is a few thousand years old, look at it to actually tell us about what was growing in the past, what were potentially humans doing in that environment. And although it may be a curse to certain people, the, uh, the valley and the seepage mires, which are distributed across much of the forest, hold these important archives where you can go out, take a cora, push it down into the, into the sediments, and then pull it up. So this is from the church moor in of Bold, Boldwood Drive, where you can get these laminated clays and silts and then all interbedded organic deposits within there. This one is still deposit in here is around 12, 13,000 years ago. Um, but you can go into these bogs and actually get a sample out of it and then actually look. Well, do these tell us something about the last few hundred years? Or in some cases, these, these records go back several thousand years. Or if you really want to be excited, uh, be lucky, you can go down to places like Stone Point and Pennington and go back hundreds of thousands of years, really into our last previous interclasals and really into our Paleolithic record by looking at these organic deposits. And the reason we are interested in those is that the organic deposits in the peaks, because they accumulate slowly over time, they trap material, they can trap things like pollen, charcoal, they actually preserve the plant remains, so you can actually go and see how has that bulk ecology changed over time, and therefore we can actually start to understand what, is, what happened in the past. So the two main things we've always looked at in these box in the pies are things like pollen grains, so hay fever sufferers will know all about these, or certainly know, will be a very good at sensing when they're around in the atmosphere. Uh, but you can look at things like oak and lime and um, polypoly spores and things like that, and you can actually extract these from the box, look at them under a microscope and see how does uh, the abundance of these change as you move up and down through a sequence to, to then infer how the ecology has changed. And you can actually look at the composition of the bogs themselves. Um, so we have, a lot of our bogs are very sphagnum rich, you can look at those, take the leaves out, look at the very fine cell structures in there, look at some of the other plant remains in there, and that can tell you about the conditions. You know, so you can look at things like, are we getting increase in wash, are we getting a climatic signal because the plants are in situ uh, uh, with the kind of climatic conditions, or so in, in equilibrium with them. And We've actually been lucky that a lot of work has been done in the New Forest over the last 60, 70 years. So particular sites such as Grainsmore have been investigated right back to uh, people like Harry Godwin, students, Stan Seagrid came out here and worked on here. Um, and we've got a range of um, sequences. The blue ones here are the dated kind of bog sequences that we have. And then we have these triangles here where people have actually been able to go undertake archaeological excavations and then underneath these monuments or banks or barrels or whatever it is, you often get a preserved um, soil horizon. And that, because it's been basically built un put underneath the monument, 
it becomes um, anaerobic, you get no oxygen down there, organics don't break down, therefore you can actually start to extract pollen uh, and charcoal and other remains from there to actually look at well, if we have a Bronze Age feature, what was, this, what was actually on that soil at that time? So we can, we've got a rich kind of um, assemblage of uh, data sets we can go through. So in this talk, I'm just going to go through some kind of highlights of the work to kind of give you a kind of an overview of what we know about the forest from the ecological background that may actually, does that, this is actually match our understanding, or our popular understanding of what happens in the new forest, which is often major periods during the Bronze Age, then we have the medieval, medieval periods, we have the Romans somewhere in the middle, but that's always slightly unsure what is actually the environmental impact of those sort of things right, back, right up into the modern day. So if we go to um, one of our kind of longest sites and the most uh, studied sites, which is Cranesmoor, which is just to the west of Burley, we have in the centre here a very large um, valley system with um, up to five, six metres of peak within it. And um, a lot of work's been done on coring across here to actually understand what is the structure of the bog. And what's quite interesting is you have, coming, coming from the ridge, you have river flow kind of coming through here, heading down towards the Avon. But you have in this area here a very sheltered part of the bog, which, has, which is actually <coughs> quite detached from catchment changes. And we've been looking at um, the plant remains in that and actually find that potentially this, this site actually became, during the Mesolithic period, a raised bog. So actually it create, created a dome uh, made, potentially made of um, sphagnum bog moss and therefore became kind of fed by atmospheric rain conditions. And the nice thing with that is then suddenly when it's in, in tandem with the atmosphere we have a very nice paleoclimatic record where we can actually go back and say how has the um, how has the climate in the New Forest actually changed over a period between around 11,000 and 5,000 years ago? And what you can also do in this bog is you have a lot of um, small remains of charcoal in there and, and the pond itself. And you can look at actually, through different time periods, uh, you can look at the how does the charcoal change compared to the plants, and although it's a bit small to see. Basically you can see that there are certain bars on here which are spiking above, uh, statistical competence, the range and some that come out below. And what it shows is that actually there are certain plants within our landscape that are responding positively to burning within the local environment. Things like bracken, things like calunas, um, so heathers are actually, every time we have a record of charcoal in the, in the uh, bulk, we start to get a positive response there. <coughs> then you also see things like pine is also responding positively to fire, whereas other things like lime and alder woodland are negatively responding to fire. And the nice thing with that is you can actually go back and think, well, what is, where, what is this fire signal? Is it purely a climatic record? So this is our charcoal records, this is our paleoclimatic record over here, where this side is basically um, <coughs> dry conditions, this side is wetter conditions. And what you do see is actually these, these burning sp spikes are coinciding predominantly with these slightly drier phases within the bog ecology. So we have, quite interesting at Cranesmore, <coughs> periods of burning during periods of increased drier climates, and therefore we have, potentially in the new forest, in the Mesolithic period, either people are opportunistically able to use fire as a land management technique during these drier climatic periods, or we actually have a, a natural fire um, signal within the, um, the forest, which is basically helping to control things like the early pine conditions, and then later it, things like hazel and oak woodland and things like that. It's very difficult to actually disentangle the archaeological site and the natural system, but certainly they could be moving in tandem. We, at least we've got evidence that if you look at elsewhere, even things like Star Car, the Kennet Valley, you have very clear evidence of Mesolithic people using fire to deliberately manage their landscape. So we may be sensing some of this kind of pre Bronze Age landscape management that we didn't ever really kind of see from the New Forest before. We can then move on through the kind of the time scale. So from this kind of early policy, we start to see the arrival of our deciduous woodland, our oak, some things, or eventually things like particularly lime wood. And lime wood is very interesting because um, it basically it responds to human activity. So you start to lose lime from your la lime woodlands from your landscape when people come in and undertake deliberate land, land, land clearance, particularly kind of taking it out to promote other th other trees. Um, or to actually just for clearance for agriculture activities and it's also particularly susceptible to very high grazing pressures um, because it's, it's often kind of been cut and produced, um, produced fodder and things like that. 
So what we can do is we can actually start to look at some of our bulk sequences to see what can they actually tell us about changes in the line width and the loss of the line width and that can therefore infer local scale clearance activity. So if we go to Barrowmore, which is in uh, of, of Boulderwood, we can see certainly in the in the early Bronze Age, we start to get a loss of uh, start to get reductions in this uh, line, but it's not really until the late Roman early Anglo-Saxon period when it completely disappears from the record. Conversely, if you go for, um, a bit closer to Lyndhurst um, near Gritlam, so if anyone knows the Oak of Gritlam, it's literally right next to the pub, which is always very nice if you go and do some work. Um, we start to see changes in it in the late Bronze Age, early Iron Age. But actually, we see a potential continuation of lime woodland in that area up until the uh, 20th century. And it's very interesting that this is the site that's closest to Lindhurst. So if you think about the name, potentially it's actually giving us evidence of where the place names are also coming from, which you do have lime and, um, and lin and those sort of names coming up quite often in the kind of, uh, place names in the forest. We can then go right down to the southeast area, so Nodesbog, which is um, off near Good and Purley, where we have a fragmentary record of lime, but potentially it actually shows it actually continued in small areas, particularly on the kind of hummock, um, these kind of node areas in there, of where you find lime today, that actually you have continuous woodland cover all the way through, so potentially kind of quite low impact. And then if we go up to um, Breaks Breaks Bottom, which is just next to Slogan Enclosure in the north of the forest, you can see actually, although we start to get some early Neolithic uh, modification for landscape, it's not really until the Iron Age and the Roman periods that actually you get that kind of major clearance occur. We can also look at things like heathland development. And heathland is a really interesting thing because it is a cultural <coughs> industry. It's something that anyone that goes across the forest will often see burn in to actually maintain the heathland so it doesn't get colonised by um, things like um, holly um, and the birch woodland and things like that, which will then eventually lead to kind of recolonisation by woodlands. So heathland is very much a cultural landscape, and it's very important to the forest, but actually understanding when it occurred is very difficult. Um, but we can go back to the polar records again to actually see are we getting spatial chain variations in it. Um, because often popular literature will always say it's Bronze Age clearance, therefore we get heathlands from the Bronze Age onwards, but actually it's a lot more complex than that. If we go to that Mesolithic record of Cranesmoor, we start to see heath taxa appearing in the, um, in the Mesolithic, so potentially small patches of heath around there, well that's quite difficult to disentangle, is it heather that grows on the bog surface or is it on the dry areas around it? It's probably a mixture of the both, um, but certainly with the, with the fire evidence and with that and the, um, the evidence in the pollen, it suggests that we are getting small patches of heath and potentially from the Mesolithic onwards. If we go up to um, High Garden Bottom, which is getting in the north of the forest, we are seeing potentially Bronze Age, Bronze Age clearance and, and leading to heath acceleration. And the same within the nose bog in the south and east where you actually get inwash horizons into these valley systems and increases in charcoal around Bronze Age period, suggesting you are getting some clearance and some burning. If we go back to their Breaks Breaks Bottom, uh, near Snowden enclosure, and then Alder Hill Bottom, which is just on the other side of the enclosure, we actually see it's the Roman period that you actually get the acceleration of heath of heath and there. And this is really nice because it ties in with the, the main concentration of the pottery industries, which Mike will talk about later. Um, and so it gives you kind of an overview from the bolts, but we can also go to the, the buried soil pollen as well, because that gives us a snapshot of when those monuments were formed. And we can see actually there's variations within that record as well, uh, of staggered heath development, particularly the kind of mid to late Bronze Age, um, associated with very base, uh, base poor soils, so things that are <coughs> overlaying plateau gravels. Um, and then we can also see some of the latest elements for um, heat development in, mid, in medieval soil horizons. So the pattern here is actually you're getting lots of different areas of heat at different times in the past. And this matches actually what we actually find across southern England. If you do get periods of accelerated heat, you do start to see it in the Bronze Age. You then get secondary accelerations in the Roman period and the medieval, and then particularly in the post-medieval. So it's not actually just one landscape from one set up period three to four thousand years ago. It's actually a kind of a steady accumulation of this environment. We can also then go to the records, and these are uh, Churchmore and Barrymore from uh, just off Boulderwood Drive, and actually look at have we got potentially woodland that we can trace back to the first arrival of woodland um, after the, place, the last glaciation. So we can take two records, and these are basically either side of Boulder Drive. We're looking at only a couple hundred metres apart. Um, Churchmore is our kind of longest record, so we're going back to around um, 11,000 years here. It goes up to around 
five and a half thousand years here. And the main thing to note, these are just your pollen curves. The red is your trees, your green is your shrub component, and then the other bits are the kind of grasses and your understory herbs. And the main thing to note is you have continuous tree and shrub cover, shrub, um, cover right away up until five and a half thousand. We can then, well, because that record has been, has been disturbed, we then jump across the road to Bar Barrymore, where we pick it up around 4,000 years. So annoyingly, there is a little gap, so we can't be 100% sure. But again, you can see this continuation of woodland cover all the way through. So we can actually potentially turn around and say, well, actually, in this woodland, this ancient ornamental woodland, we can say that actually this has potentially always been, had a woodland component, it's always had a canopy. And actually, you can't say that in many places in the, in the UK. You can go back and say, oh, it's ancient woodland. It's got really important um, insect pores and, and, and mosses and all these sorts of things and fungi that point towards ancient woodland. But often, when you can, if you can get these pollen records and scratch below the surface, you'll see that actually, this was probably clear, those areas were probably clear felled during the Roman period or Bronze Age period, and then you have secondary colonisation. But we can turn around and actually, for parts of Boulder Tribe, and say, it's always had woodland throughout the whole period, and therefore that makes it even more exciting and more important. We can also then, we'll just kind of finish, uh, finishing up off now, um, we can look at one of our kind of archetypal, really exciting parts of the world, which is the beach, with the, the famous Silvatica. And these are really exciting because they really link us to our cultural heritage, because you can go there and you can see these upstanding, massive pollards, which gives you a a, kind of, a real kind of vision of what it may have looked like in the past when these were under active woodland management. And in certainly nature conservation and for the forest, beaches are really important. It's, it's under, under extreme stress, under potential modern climate, future climate change. We have these areas in certain of the woodlands, like Denningwood and uh, Mark Ashwood, where you're having canopy collapse, where basically all the trees with the similar age, they're now getting to the age where they're dying off. There isn't the understory to come through and fill it. So what you end up with is basically areas of heath recolonising, areas of these grass, so particularly bracken coloured areas, as the woodland kind of starts to break down and become more open uh, from the inside. So beach is really important, and it's always seen as kind of a keystone you need to protect this in the forest. And we have some what we call ecolo modern ecology, which we call long-term records of going back a couple of hundred years where you've actually got detailed vegetation surveys but we can use our pollen records to really go long term, back several thousand years. And what we actually see is beech doesn't actually really start to take off in the forest until the medieval period. We do have traces where it's in the pollen record back several thousand years, but it is a very minor component of the woodland. But it's only really during this medieval period, post-medieval period, where things, particularly things like the naval, um, naval pressures on the forest were removing oak and the beech became a more dominant component. Um, it was also encouraged plantations and things like that with these, these woodlands. That actually beach becomes the really important component of the new forest as we see it today. But actually, if you look at that, you could say, well, actually, it's not really supposed to be there in the levels it is nowadays. So it actually, the beach woodlands are very much a result of deliberate human impact over the forest and deliberate manipulation of the landscape. So if I kind of summarise it the way we are, we can also take all our pollen records, we can accumulate them, and we can actually do some, we've done some modelling. So this is a, a student, a PhD student, we had Sarah Pogue, who finished a couple of years ago. The problem with pollen records is on this side, you get lots of pollen, but of course certain trees will produce loads of pollen, certain other plants will produce very little pollen. So you will always get an overabundance, potentially, of woodland component in your records. What we can do is we can do some quite exciting modelling of that pollen data to actually kind of adjust it, readjust it. And then this is what, uh, using some model called reveals models, where you can actually come up with a more realistic estimate of past land cover. And what you can see is certainly it shows the woodland component <coughs> fairly steady through most of the kind of um, the prehistoric period. And it's only really in more recent years that you're starting to see that mountain cover dropping off as you get in particularly some of the increased, uh, increased grass cover. You're getting the appearance of our plantations at the top, whereas this is the point where things like pine are starting to disappear from the forest. Um, you can also start to try and model some of the kind of heathlands, although that's very difficult. But you can see this kind of constant lower levels all the way through at the bottom, it kind of reduces um, during kind of late Bronze Age, Iron Age. Um, and then it really kind of starts to kind of fluctuate during the medieval period, increasing um, 
increasing kind of in the late, late normal, normal period, and then it's kind of fluctuating around up until modern day. So we can start to look at the dynamics over long term. It's entirely simple with our mapping evidence from the last few months to calibrate our models. Um, you could say we fudged our models by choosing the best, best model output that matches the data we have, but at least it gives, gives us an insight. Um, so to kind of give you a summary of, of what we can do with these records and what they've shown is, is they, they give us a detailed picture of variations in human activity across the new forest during the prehistoric and historic periods. It is not just everything is changing at set time scales across the whole forest. It is very patchy. It is a mosaic of different activity. As we see nowadays, it is a mosaic of different vegetation communities, and those can be kind of implanted and, and referred back to how they've developed uh, through human intervention. We can see potential for Mesolithic landscape and management activity within the forest. And our Mesolithic record is very scarce within the forest. It is down to these uh, dispersed small scatters. We do so see some concentrations on the, the eastern part of the forest, but we know so little about Mesolithic because it is down to chance find spots. We don't have any stratified um, archaeological sites that we can actually go and excavate and really learn about what people were doing at that time. But we can certainly start to infer um, that there was activity and it was potentially using fire to, to manage that landscape. Um, we see that the, the loss of the lime, the lime woodland is over a prolonged period, but we do have patches where it potentially survives to modern day, suggesting these were areas with low impact as a, you know, in relation to clearance activity. These were managed woodlands at some point, but at least we have continuation of lime until modern day. And we can see the Haithland expansion is a multi-period. It has phases where you have increased clearance um, and uh, fossilisation and soil deterioration leading to heath development. And we can actually see in some locations it coincides with the archaeological records quite nicely. We can show that the new forest does have potentially continuous woodland, uh, um, woodland cover in some areas through the last 10, 11,000 years. Um, and we can finally say that beach was probably never a major component of the woodland, the woodlands of the new forest, and it's only a result of human intervention and basically human engineering of the landscape that has led to its dominance now, and potentially the problems we have going forward. But how, why is it struggling so much in the forest, even with intervention? Are we putting all our efforts into the wrong area? I'll leave it with that. Thank you.